I grow up, I'm going to be a doctor. A mom and a doctor. I want to be a famous soccer player. A fisherman. I want to be a fighter. I want to be a scientist. When I grow up, I'm going to be a teacher. A vet. I might want to be a police girl. Dentist. When I grow up, I want to be a prospector. A plane flyer. I want to be a veterinarian. A helicopter flyer. I would like to be a teacher, maybe. A taxi driver. Uh, I want to be a computer programmer, like to make video games. I want to be an architect. I want to be a singer. Superhero. Another veterinarian. Another doctor. When you look into these faces, it's pretty easy to realize each one is someone's precious child. Someone cares for them, someone values them, someone wants them to be happy and find fulfillment in their life. To them, work is going to be fun. They'd never dream that work might be a dismal existence where they're micromanaged into a state of oblivion because they feel valued, appreciated, cared for. They have no reason to believe that somebody'd go out of their way to make them feel less than that. So what happens? Why is it when we go to work, most employers don't think of us as precious or valued? Instead, we are what we do. We are functions rather than people. We're expendable. We don't really matter. Wouldn't it be great if we lived in a world where, wait for it, everybody matters. There's not a person in this world that I know that likes to be micromanaged. I don't think that people really necessarily feel valued at all. I think but. more of them think less about their people, more about their bottom dollar. What about your bosses? What's... <laughs> Can we change this on you? <laughs> if you had a better boss, what would a better boss do? More friendly, more appreciate. The employees maybe will be nice. You know, most managers and you know bosses that mean they don't they don't show that they care. That's that's really how they are. If you care for them, you know they feel they feel something for the company, and it's not just you know I'm working. It's I'm working for someone that actually cared for me when I needed someone to care for me or something like that. You know. My company's been good to me, but. But they drop me if, if, the, if the dollars and cents aren't there, you know. But I don't blame them for that. That's business. That's America. <laughs> Anybody that's got a job they complain about, they need to go somewhere else because that's, that's not good for your health. And a lot of people are doing just that, leaving. According to Forbes, two million people leave their jobs every month because of poor leadership, lack of trust and empowerment, internal politics, and a lack of recognition. A Mercer study showed 32% of the workforce is actively looking for a new gig at any given moment. And 75% of workers say they take another job if one came along because they don't feel valued, appreciated, or cared for by their employer. I mean, I just talked to a lady that worked for me at the other company. She hasn't had a raise in seven years. She went to the boss the other day and asked if she could get a raise, and their response to her was, you're getting a paycheck every Friday. If you don't like it, leave. The short-sightedness of this sort of thinking is comical, and the productivity loss due to low morale is staggering. A Gallup study found in the U.S. alone, unhappy, disengaged, unfulfilled workers cost the economy up to $500 billion per year. That's half a trillion dollars of lost productivity. That's a stack of $100 bills that would literally pass the International Space Station. And that's just the financial toll. What about the human loss? What about the fact that just doing the right thing, doing good, could actually make work and the world a better place? Best-selling author Simon Sinek has been saying that for years. I think the major problem in business leadership today is that there is no leadership. There's a lot of management. It's, it's a very short-term attitude to just think of people as a resource that you just pay and expect them to do their work. I mean, you don't even have to take it uh, from a human perspective. The human perspective, isn't it good to look after people? You know, these, this is a team where it's responsible for the lives of human beings. But if you want to be cold-hearted about it, people who like coming to work more, are more productive. People who feel safe amongst their own, who can trust the people that they work with, are more likely to offer bigger ideas, take better risks, be more innovative, be more productive. I mean, there's a whole host of good business reasons that has nothing to do with the, the humanity of it all. Well, that's nice, Simon, but are there businesses that care about humanity? Well, there are quite a few businesses like this that do exist out there. As this is Raj Sisodia, another best-selling author and professor of global business at Babson College. Well-known companies like Southwest Airlines and, and Google and Starbucks and Costco and Container Store and Patagonia 
And Barry Waymiller certainly is, is very much part of that framework as well. Now I know what you're thinking. Who is Barry Waymiller? But it's not a who, it's a what. And chances are you come in contact with something made by a Barry Waymiller machine every single day. Barry Waymiller is a manufacturing and consulting company based in St. Louis that builds and designs machines that make things, like the top of nearly every aluminum can in the world, cereal boxes, toilet tissue, corrugated boxes, all kinds of labels, pet food bags. They even hold the patent on those tiny little metal clasps on manila envelopes. And 80% of the world's medicines pass through a BW centrifuge. They build bottle fillers, pasteurizers, conveyors, corrugators, labelers, the list is endless. They're made up of more than 80 companies with over 10,000 employees worldwide. Around the year 2000, they came to the realization that the most valuable part of the company wasn't their manufacturing or consulting, but rather their people. And leadership, not management, was going to make the difference. This guy is Bob Chapman, Barry Waymiller's CEO. He'll be the first to admit that in his early days of leadership, people-centric thinking was not part of his business plan. I did plan. things, I was a nice guy, I had a positive attitude, but I wouldn't say to you I was sensitive to the impact of my initiatives on people. It was about numbers. That's the, I came from accounting and, and MBA programs, and it's all about building shareholder value, not human value. So my early days were very traditional. You had to, if you had to let people go or uh, fire people, you did it. I mean, that's, that's what you do in business. You know, I just, that's business. And then that's the conventional thought that exists in most places today. It's just business. It's not human, it's business. It's, it's about numbers. How did you feel working for that company? Ah, uh, like a miserable little piss ant. Like a number. <laughs> yeah, like a number. Like a number or a prisoner, really. <laughs> like a number is how most of the employees of Barry Waymiller felt for the majority of its life before they changed their rudder and began to put people in the forefront. To better understand where this company is today, it'll help to know where it came from. This isn't some Silicon Valley startup. The Barry Waymiller company dates back to 1885. Grover Cleveland was president. Carl Benz was about to patent the first automobile. Charles Dow was publishing the first Dow Jones Industrial Averages. And Thomas Berry opened a machine shop in St. Louis, Missouri, soon to be joined by his brother-in-law, Alfred Waymiller, founding the Berry Waymiller Machinery Company. From bottle washers and conveyor systems to pasteurization machines, most customers were from the brewing and beverage industry. So dependent on brewing, prohibition should have been the end of the company, not to be outdone by the Great Depression. It was a constant cycle of survival without thrival. Is thrival a word? Now fast forward to 1950. In 1950, Bill Chapman, Bob's dad, an accountant from Arthur Anderson, comes aboard as general manager and treasurer, bringing experience and leadership. His influence grows, and by 1953, he's named president. A decade later, ownership of the entire Barry Waymiller company passes to the Chapman family. Meanwhile, Bob attends college and then grad school. He works at Arthur Anderson and then Price Waterhouse. And in 1969, his dad asks him to come work for Barry Waymiller. He accepts and works alongside his father for six years until one morning in 1975. He got up that morning, ran an errand to a friend of theirs house before they went to the airport, and he passed out and died. Clearly, I was shocked that all of a sudden he wasn't here. And I think motivated by my dad's sudden death, the fact that I felt his hard work to try and build this company that I'd grown to appreciate fully, a sense that when it happened, I was ready. You know, I was ready to take command. Although Bob was ready to take command, the bankers in New York were not as confident. Our bankers flew in from New York and said, uh, sorry about your father, but uh, given the performance of the company, your father's death, we really think we need to be repaid our loans and we need to end this relationship. That was exactly what I needed in hindsight. Because my reaction was to grab a hold of that business, pay down that debt, and get the company on track. The next nine months resulted in the most profitable year in the history of the company. And we paid down our bank debt, and all of a sudden we went from not being bankable to banks approaching us. Really, for the first time in over a century, Barry Waymiller was a thriving company. 
As they thrive, they develop new technologies like solar and automatic inspection systems. They bought out a joint venture in the United Kingdom called BWI. Revenue soared from $18 million to $71 million in only four years. Mark Chapman would say everything we touched turned to gold, but we were about to come to a cliff and that was going to come to an abrupt end. And in 1983, what appeared to be too good to be true was the core markets dramatically changed overnight because instead of building new breweries, they started buying breweries that were being shut down. Solar energy systems started having technology problems. Electronic systems had technology problems. We wound up with warranty issues. We had a bunch of inventory that became obsolete, and so we had a $5.5 million warranty and inventory write-off, which put us in a very big loss. One of the banks who told me how much they supported us shut down radically our credit lines to the point where we didn't know we could make payrolls. The consequence of all this was we were buried in debt, we had no money coming in, and we had all of our vendors and people who wanted money knocking at our door, including the bank. So as one of our last resorts during this period of time, we looked to an asset-based loan. This is certainly not something that, that you'd want to do normally because essentially what you're doing is you're pledging all of the assets that you have to this loan and they're giving you a, a ceiling in terms of what they'll lend to you. We begrudgingly went that direction because we really had no other opportunity. I just walked around the table and signed hundreds of documents that basically said if you ever hiccup, your business is ours. Now it was my only chance to get out of jail free. So I would have signed anything so I actually had money I could pay a bill. So as time went on, we continued to survival mode on a day-to-day -day basis, and, and certainly that wasn't providing us a mechanism that would put us in a place where we were stepping above it and we were able to flourish once more. I went to my finance team and I said, we've got to do acquisitions to create a future. And my finance team looked at me and said, Bob, great idea. We only got one problem, Bob. They said, Bob, we don't have any money. And I said, don't tell me what we can't do. I didn't tell you we had to have money. I told you we need to do acquisitions because that's the only way we're going to be able to create a future for our people. So what kind of company do you buy when you have no money? companies that nobody else wants. So over the next few years, they acquired several small companies. And while individually they weren't worth much, the hidden value was clear when they merged them into a single company. Tapped out of credit, millions in debt. Our core business was still struggling. Citicorp had grown tired of the relationship and wanted us to repay the loan. With the debt pressure mounting, an idea came from the European team to combine these new acquisitions with the European division and sell them off on the London Stock Exchange as an IPO. They hoped they'd make enough money to pay off their debt and maybe end up with an extra $2 million in the bank. Out of debt, $2 million in the bank sounded like heaven. So we went forward with the IPO and as it turns out, it was 31 times oversubscribed. So if you're new to multinational business deals, 31 times oversubscribed means that they expected a certain number of buyers. But that number was 31 times larger than they anticipated. To make it even more simple, this was a really, really good thing for Barry Waymiller. Go ahead, Mike. Right. Back the money and net of taxes, we wound up with approximately $28 million in the bank. Well in excess of the $2 million that we anticipated almost miraculous to the company to have this new beginning for us. In fact, it was so remarkable that it was something that Harvard determined would be an appropriate case study for them to do. The rest is history in terms of all of that activity that took place. This was a new era for Barry Waymiller. Bob and his team were on a mission now to design a company that could thrive even in the tough times. So we times. designed a business that had balance of markets, products, technology, aftermarket new equipment. We designed it and then we went out and looked for companies that allowed us to achieve that. And so we began doing acquisitions with a clarity of exactly of this balance that we never had before. But now we had the luxury of cash, experience, and credibility. So at the time, the leadership team was looking for companies to acquire, and they were companies that needed help because we had the experiences of the 80s and we felt that that was value that we could bring to companies, but also ones that added to what we were already doing. And when you uh, get into an acquisition, probably your greatest anxiety occurs as soon as the seller says yes, because then the reality sets in of, I hope we know everything that we need to know to be successful uh, with this acquisition. 
You know, when, when the acquisition was announced, of course, there's a ton of concern. Everybody was sick of losing. I can tell you that it was a deflated, demoralized team here. This acquisition was absolutely the best thing that could have happened to me. It is not the same company as it was prior to Barry Way Miller in a very positive light. Mark Hoop was going through bankruptcy, and um, before we knew about the acquisition, it was a very scary time for us. This is a small town, so when Barry Way Miller came in and made the acquisition, I personally believe that they saved Phillips. Saving a town is a pretty lofty statement, but it was through acquisitions like the one in Phillips, Wisconsin that challenged Bob and his team to realize a greater sense of responsibility for their rapidly growing number of employees. What I realized is that everything I learned about being a good parent was about leadership. Everything I learned in business school was about management. Everything I learned was wrong in terms of the relationship I had with the people in our organization. We were so shaped by a series of experiences that really made the company what it is today. From the late 1990s to early 2000s, three different experiences began to shape my view of how do we could be better stewards of people's lives. Uh, what we call the sort of why can't business be fun movement. He had completed an acquisition and he was in a new facility, saw people in the morning talking around coffee, talking about March Madness, and, and then he watched them walk back to their offices as it got closer to eight o'clock, and he watched the energy and the enthusiasm drain out of their bodies, and he just kind of asked himself, why can't business be fun? Why do we call it work? Why do we call it a job? Why can't it be fun? talks about um, sitting in church and the rector of his church, Ed Salmon, who we found so inspirational. He sitting there feeling in awe of how Ed was able to touch the lives of the people in their congregation. And what he realized was that he said, wait a minute, we have a bigger congregation at Barry Waymiller than he does. And we touch their lives not one hour a week, but 40 hours a week or more. So if what if- If we use that time we have people in our care to help shape their life and give them a chance to be who they're intended to be. So that was really the beginning of a huge transformational learning experience for us as we started to see the true power of our leadership in business. So then I was sitting in a wedding. A friend of ours was walking his daughter down the aisle, took the hand of his daughter. He said, her mother and I give our daughter to be wed to this young man. As a father, I knew that that's not really what that father meant to say. What he meant to say is, look at young man. Her mother and I brought this precious young lady into our life. We've given her everything we can possibly give her so she can be who she's intended to be. And we expect for the two of you to be stewards of each other's life so each of you can be who you're intended to be. Do you understand that, young man? That moment, my mind went to our 11,000 people. And I said to myself, all 11,000 of our people are somebody's precious child who we have the care for for 40 hours a week. And if we're responsible, we can have a profound impact. And it changed the way I thought of everything because before that event, I saw the people in our organization as employees and functions, an accountant, a secretary, receptionist, an engineer, production team member. I didn't see them as somebody's precious child. I saw them as a function, a function for my success. And after that day, I realized they weren't a function. They were somebody's precious child, just like that young lady that walked down the aisle. And our responsibility is to be a good steward of that life while they're in our care. So we had realized the power of writing down what we wanted our company to be in our vision and putting that down on paper. And now we realized that there would be power in writing down how we wanted it to be to work here. Management suppresses people's ability. What we need to do is, is, is to allow people to rise to that. And that's what our leadership does. We don't do this to improve profitability. We don't do it to improve productivity. We do it because this is the way you are called to lead. So we really started to articulate what would it feel like to work here? What would the experience be that people had here? And that document came to be the guiding principles of leadership, or we now call it the GPL. The GPL basically kind of threw out all the rules. You know, it's, it's no longer strictly about uh, profits or how well you manage people, but it's about uh, true leadership and caring for people. The risk is if you're gonna go down this road, and say, we all coming together and aspiring to act in this way, and we're going to write it down on paper. This is a genie out of the bottle piece, right? You don't get it back in. You don't come back and say, oh, that whole thing where we said we want to treat everyone with trust and respect and we believe in people, you're not doing that anymore, right? You can't bring it back. 
This is a checks and balances that everyone gets to look and says something like, hey, if we're based on trust and respect and treating people and everyone has an equal voice, um, why are the first 16 rows of our parking lot reserved for vice presidents who don't arrive until this time in the morning? And I'm on first shift at 6 a.m. and I have to walk past all those empty spots when it's snowing. Great question. So we had written this vision of our culture, what we hoped it could be, the GPL, and we came back and shared that excitedly with the organization. And one of the best things that happened is that we got some very challenging feedback. Someone sent me Enron's values document. So the challenge was, and I went to Bob with this challenge and said, you know, how are we going to be any different than Enron or any of those other companies with these beautiful values? Because statements? of the stimulation of that challenge. Otherwise, we probably would have hung it up. Because of the Enron environment, we said, I'm going to go out. I'm going to go out and speak the guiding principle of leadership and ask people to react. So that's what we did. And we went out and sat down with groups of about 20 people or so and started to talk to them about this vision for our culture that we had written and asked them, how are we doing against that? And boy, did we learn some things from those listening sessions. When the GPL was written, there were, there were a lot of skeptical people that did not see that vision. A lady stood up in the back of the room and she said, I don't trust you at all, lady. And I thought about it for a second and I responded to her. I said, you know, I don't blame you. You don't have any reason to trust me. You've been through a lot. Her company had been bought out of bankruptcy. She'd seen a lot of her friends come and go. So I said, you know, we probably need to earn your trust by our actions. There's incredible power in listening as a leader to go out and really, really be willing to listen to what is on people's minds and what's frustrating them and to be willing to take action. I think that takes a level of bravery as a leader that few leaders have. A gentleman said to me, I I had the opportunity, the privilege to represent the company to go install some machinery in Puerto Rico. I had an expense account. I handled myself, I think, professionally in front of the customer. When I came back, and I was walking in with one of the ladies in the accounting department, we got to a point where she turned left and went into the office, and I went forward and went into the plant, and everything changed. We were no longer equal. If she wanted to call home, she just picked up the phone and called home. If I wanted to call home, I had to get my money to go use a payphone because we weren't given the right to use company phones. We had to use payphones. If she wanted to get a cup of coffee, she went and got a cup of coffee. I had to wait until the bell rang for the coffee break. Why is it when I'm in Puerto Rico, you trust me, and when I'm in the plant, you don't? And I said, that is brilliant. You couldn't have nailed it better. We're going to change that tomorrow. He wasn't complaining. He was just pointing out, as I'd ask him, where you're not living these principles. And he was brilliant in the way he expressed it. And that changed our attitude, uh, how we were going to live these principles dramatically, because he gave us a chance to start changing to live these principles more fully. Some of the first changes that we implemented were really basic. You think about break bells that tell people when they can get a cup of coffee, removing those from every location. When you first walked out into our assembly area, you know, there was a caged area. And if I wanted to get safety glasses, a drill, a tap, a piece of tape, uh, a battery for something that I needed to do my job at work, I would have to go to an attendant and actually ask them to give me that component, whatever it was. And Bob, the first thing he did when he took a tour of our shop, he says, that comes down. That that cage comes down. We're going to trust our people. And we gave him all the reasons why that, that's probably not a good idea. You know, our costs are going to go up to people. You know, might take that. And he said, we'll deal with that. But that goes down. We're going to trust our people. We now have a cafeteria that's uh, self-serve. So not only do we, do we uh, trust people, I can walk over here and if I so choose, I could steal this, and there's, there's no cameras watching us. Uh, but we trust people that are, they're not gonna do that. And so I have to come here and, and scan it. So now I walk away. And you know, I can tell you, we didn't even have a cafeteria, and now we have a self-serve cafeteria that's totally on our honor. Trusting people, listening to people, all of the changes being implemented were resonating. The GPL was proving to be more than just words hung on a wall. One of the biggest examples came in the form of recognizing and celebrating people for living out these new values. Recognition and celebration is a very important piece of our culture. I would say it's a cornerstone of our culture. It is absolutely foundational to our organization. And one way to do that is we plan these events around the person that's actually the recipient of the award, and we try to incorporate as much of their family members, close friends, sometimes to bring people from their churches and things of that nature and make it very special and meaningful to that particular individual. 
you can even see in people's faces. Nobody is really expecting recognition. We do it in a, in a big way. It's really an exercise that we do now because people want to know they make a difference. But even with the changes, the listening sessions and celebrations, there were still many naysayers refusing to embrace the people-centric culture. I just ignored it. People-centric was just another catchphrase, you know, flavor of the month type of thing. To say that I didn't believe in it would be an understatement. I was completely against it and was actually kind of fighting against it because it, it didn't make any sense to me. Yeah, at first it seemed like a joke. What is this? What are, what's this stuff? You know? <laughs> yeah. Just we're, we're used to coming here, working, doing our job, going home. That's what you do. There was a lot of skeptics, but when 2008 came around, that was the big test. Let's talk about the speed with which we are watching this market down, down, down at the same time, same time has fallen about 18%. 18 percent. One percent. It was it was it was challenging. I was looking at it going, uh oh, where's this going now? Roughly March of 2009, we had about a $30 million order for one of our major customers put on hold because of the financial situation in the world. And we all realized that we were probably in trouble. We didn't know where the bottom was. We didn't know how long it was going to last. It's heartbreaking. I mean, you know, there goes, there goes the job. Well, you, you kind of figured you didn't have a job or wondering when you were going to be laid off. It was, it was scary, you know but you can see it happening all over the place. I mean, everybody is slowing down. Everything is slowing down, so. It was pretty challenging, but I think this is where leadership occurs, even though it was razor thin. And, and think of like a, our, our campus in Phillips, Wisconsin, huge amount of the population that they work there. Um, this, uh, this is gonna affect not just um, individual lives and a house here on this corner and a house over here. This is gonna affect a town. I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm shaking thinking about it. That was, it was really, it really was a scary moment. That was the first real test of whether Barry Way Miller would do what it said it was going to do. What would a caring family do if, if, if one of the family members was under crisis? They would all pitch together so that everybody might take a little pain, so that nobody had to take a lot of pain. There was a lot of our business units um, that were weathering the storm well, and a lot of the business units um, that were really struggling, that literally did not have work for our associates uh, each and every day. Bob sent out an email to everybody saying that, you know, we are in the midst of a crisis, orders are down, and this is what we are going to do. What if, Instead of letting anybody go, we just gave everybody a month off without pay, uh, and they could take it whenever they wanted to. So this was really from the top down. Bob reduced his salary to his starting salary when he began his career at Arthur Anderson. People came to me and said, Bob, you can achieve the same goal if you just cut everybody's salary by 5%. And I said, that doesn't seem fair. If we're gonna ask people to compromise, we are going to give them something in return, which is quality time at a time they want to take it. Business units that were doing well, people still took a furlough. You think about how would a caring family respond? We would all sacrifice some so that nobody would have to sacrifice a lot. And that was like a huge sigh of relief for everyone. You could swap, you know, say Joe didn't want to take his week of furlough and Mike wanted it. Mike would take Joe's week and it, it worked good. Kept Joe working and kept Mike at home, you know, when he could afford to be at home. But it, it was a good program for everybody. And it actually became a great coming together across the organization of how we're gonna get through this as a family. That was where the real question was. Are, are we gonna live to our ideals? They wanted to save our jobs, make sure that we were secure so that, you know, we could, we could have a job to come back to that built trust of maybe this company is really for real. Maybe they really do care about us. Unfortunately, it's unusual when you see someone running a company that interested in, in people. That's sad. I'm proud to be working in a place that does care about people. And going through that phase, a lot of the people that were skeptical at first, now they're in. That sealed the deal. This GPL is real. It's real. Having won over many of the skeptical hearts and minds, productivity and revenue flourished, even in the midst of the recession. The people-centric culture wasn't perfect, but at its core, people were getting it. Leaders were learning to listen and trust and care. 
and even some of the hardest of hearts were changing. Yeah, it, it was a point in my life where I was realizing that I was, you know, I had that in me to care for somebody. And when somebody would say, I really can't afford to take a furlough, I felt it. I, I felt like I need to, I can take that for you. If you can stay here and work, I really do want you, know, you to be okay, which was a new thing for me to worry about someone else and say, I'll, I'll do it for you. I have a completely new perspective on how I view people. People are the most important thing to me. Um, I used to push people away. Now I need to surround myself with people. But also I look for the ones that were like I was. I want to have that opportunity to do for them what everyone's done for me. There's a lot of great examples of people doing great things to teach lean or continuous improvement outside our own organization. But as we sent people away to classes, they came back with the tools and the terms, but they didn't come back with the passion and the sense for culture and fulfillment and commitment to people that we had. We don't teach us in our schools. We obviously don't teach us in the MBA programs. And this isn't a slam on an MBA program. I think you need those quantifiable skills, but I think you also need the human skills to go along with that. You lead people. You can manage a spreadsheet. You don't manage people. No one likes to be managed. No one likes to be supervised. No one likes to be bossed. In the Guiding Principles of Leadership, we have a bullet that says, leaders are called to be visionaries, coaches, mentors, teachers, and students. And so that's why we created Barry Waymiller University. We wanted to create a way to share this new thought on what leadership is. Really importantly, how do we listen to our team members? We teach skills which help people empower others by listening to them. And it's an important skill to have as a leader if we are interested in touching the lives of people. Listening plays such an integral part in it. Their motto says, we measure success by the way we touch the lives of people. And not just their own people, but all people. Which is part of the reason they launched the Barry Waymiller Leadership Institute. Where outside leaders from all kinds of backgrounds come to be inspired and hopefully carry that inspiration back to their own organizations. But realistically, how does that work? Do leaders really connect to an idea of putting people above profit? <laughs> One of the things that people always will misquote us saying is that it's it's people above profits, right? And that's just simply not the way it is. It's people and profits in harmony. The biggest way that we touch the lives of our people is by them knowing that they have the security of their job tomorrow. That is an awesome leadership responsibility. Numbers are important here too, but we feel if you focus on people, if you use the ideas of people, if you give people responsible freedom, the numbers will follow. If my value is measured by the size of my patient, check, I'm not going to have a fulfilling life. If my value is measured by the lives of the people I impact, and if I in small ways have a chance to contribute to the fulfillment of others, that's something that I'm going to look back on years from now and be proud of. My dream is for my kids to one day work for a company where they will not feel like a number. You know, I want them to experience that same culture that I experienced here at Barry Wayman. I want them to feel valued. I want them to feel loved. Having children um, whose parents work in our uh, company also come to work in our business is one of the best compliments you can have because it reflects the parents coming home and speaking positively about our culture and recommending that their kids actually come here. Uh, to me, it allows a thriving legacy to continue. <laughs> We're far from perfect. I mean, far from perfect. We're not utopia. We aren't perfect. I don't think we want to be perfect. We are absolutely not perfect. We acknowledge it. We're trying to attack the areas that we aren't perfect. This is a journey. There may be somebody that we haven't asked to express their gifts yet. Shame on us. We will get there. We will focus on it. All we ask is that we have the time and we ask our leaders to go out and keep on providing environments where there's trust, where there's listening, and opportunity to express people's frustrations and that be okay. I'm happy. That's all, I mean, that's all I can say. Like I said, I'm happy. I, I mean, I wish I'd have been able to start here 30 years ago, but I found a company like this to work for. When you know someone trusts you, it actually raises your awareness. I mean, you're almost like you're trying to meet what they already expect out of you. Yeah, I love my job. It's a great place to work. It's a challenge. I love my job. 
<laughs> what more can I ask for? Somebody once told me years ago, the greatest motivator is fear. And he meant in, in business. People need to be afraid of you and afraid they're going to lose their job. Otherwise, they won't do what they need to do. I just think that's terribly wrong. And I don't think that's where you want. You want to work. You've worked for it. And you don't work for other people like that. I, I think that I think that what Bob has achieved and what Barry Waymiller demonstrates is that it doesn't all change overnight. It is it is a momentum. It is like exercise. It is like parenting. You know, it's hard work, and you don't always get to see the results of all of that labor and stress and sacrifice. But you get these little glimmers that you realize it's it's all worth it, and and that's kind of the point. I don't think it's a possible to overstate the importance and the power and the potential of creating a work environment where people feel valued and respected and have an opportunity to be fulfilled in their work. And it doesn't matter whether you're in a service business or you're in a manufacturing business, it makes no difference. At the end of the day, everyone wants to be part of something. And if you give me an opportunity to play a meaningful role, I'm gonna give you 150%. And any organization powered by people who care and are cared for is a heck of a lot better place to work. It's a better place to buy things from. Um, it's just a better place. The most exciting part of life is learning. And being a better listener, being a better husband, being a better father, being a better leader, being a better friend, being a better community member. I think we should all aspire to never be satisfied with where we are and always be better. And that's our whole message is, is to be good stewards of the lives entrusted to us. That is what leadership is. It is the stewardship of the lives entrusted to you.